Mark of the Thief by Jennifer Nielsen Chapter 27 Caesar's temple was grand, ornate, and very tall, but not particularly large inside. The Vestalis told us we were free to remain as long as we wanted, but warned that the Roman soldier had been correct before. Once we left, the laws of asylum no longer protected us. I kept my back to the other patrons, who seemed equally uninterested in me. The last thing I needed was their curiosity. While we obviously couldn't stay in this temple forever, I wasn't sure I could even last the night. My hunger was becoming desperate. When in another day or two, if I didn't risk my life trying to outrun the soldiers, I'd lose it anyway to starvation. I glanced over at Aurelia, who didn't seem much better off. She eyed the sheath for her knife like it was dried meat, and I wouldn't have been surprised if she gave it a taste, just to be sure. As we entered the afternoon hours, the temple seemed less busy, though the forum was as lively as ever. A careful glance outside the doors indicated the soldiers were still there, determined to wait me out. I walked into the cella, where Aurelia was on the floor leaning against a wall. At first I thought her mind was somewhere much further away, but once I sat she whispered, If Radolf has the Divine Star on his shoulder too, then maybe that's how he found you. Maybe you're connected. Or maybe his soldiers saw me go into the sewers. That was a better thought than acknowledging any connection between us. I didn't want to think about how his voice got into my head. I don't understand what happened in the cistern. There are easier ways to kill you. I looked over at her. Well, that's good to know. Thanks, Aurelia. I only mean that if we he wanted you dead, why go through this elaborate attempt at drowning you? He wanted to scare me into unsealing the room, but I don't think he wanted me to drown. How else could I explain the moment I had almost given up when he urged me to force myself back to the air? Obviously, it had something to do with the bulla, but too many questions still remained, although it sent a shiver down my spine. Aurelia was right. There were easier ways for Radolf to get me. How are you going to take Radolf's magic? Aurelia asked. Is that even possible? I think so. I hope so. He'll probably try to do the same to you, Aurelia said, before he kills you. I shook my head at her. Is this a normal thing for you? Encouraging people right into the grave? I just think you need to be realistic about what you're facing. I gestured around us. We're starving and trapped in here with soldiers waiting to arrest me. Radolf is probably already on his way here, and I doubt he'll care about the laws of asylum. I perfectly understand the reality of my situation. Our situation. More quietly, Aurelia said. I'll stay with you until we get this figured out. I promise. I couldn't hold back a grin. The way my life has gone since I met you, that sounds more like a threat. She giggled and squeezed my arm. I wish she had not withdrawn her hand as quickly as she did, but at the same time I wasn't brave enough to reach for it again. Aurelia should have been as tired as I was but she spent the next half hour tapping her feet or fidgeting with her nails, maybe out of frustration at being trapped in here. Not me. I was glad for the chance to rest. Aside from the hunger, which was already bad enough, the magic I'd used underground had drained me, and the stinging in my back was growing worse. It felt like hundreds of needles were poking at me all at once, going deeper each time. I shifted around in hopes of revealing the discomfort, but movement only seemed to make it worse. Probably that was Caesar's reminder that he didn't want me here in his temple. 
as if I wasn't already perfectly clear on that. By early evening, the temple patrons had grown tired of their worship, and it cleared out, leaving us entirely alone. Aurelia had fallen asleep, and I finally dared to take out the bulla and really look at it. The soft glow that had drawn me to it from the very first was still there. When I opened it up, I saw why. The jewels inside were the finest stones I'd ever seen. The largest was a bright green emerald, set between a purple amethyst and a blazing red stone that I didn't recognize. All of them were glowing. The bulla was cool now, and I was beginning to understand that the magic only worked when it was warm. But I didn't know what caused it to heat, or how it was connected to the mark on my back, or how its power was supposed to be controlled. Maybe it couldn't be controlled, at least by a human. If Venus had abandoned Caesar and withdrawn her powers from the bulla, then someone else was giving it power now. But who? Hopefully it wasn't any of the gods who considered my life their personal game of dice. I stood and walked over to Caesar's statue, expecting the bulla to warm when it came closer to him. But it didn't. The magic in it was no longer his. For reasons I could not explain, it was mine now. Are you sure that Senator Valerius has your sister? Unsure of how long Aurelia had been awake, I immediately hung the bulla back around my neck and hid it. I told his son that before I agreed to talk, Valerius would have to get Livia from the mines. She's got to be with him. Why would he do that for you? He must want something big in exchange. Of course he does. That gnawed at me. It was something to do with the magic, obviously, but that's what everyone wanted, so I couldn't avoid it forever. At least Valerius was willing to help me, too. Why do you trust Valerius? You're so opposed to Horatio, but both men are senators, and both are loyal to the Emperor. I moved back to the wall and scuffed my bare foot against the floor. When Valerius first saw the mark on my back, he tried to protect me. Then I looked up and met her gaze. He was hiding it from Horatio. She didn't seem to like that, and only turned away. Well, maybe Valerius seems nice now, but in the end there'll be a price for it. I smirked back at her. Probably, but I already know the price for you being nice to me. She chuckled. It's a good theory, Nick. But you and I both know I haven't been at all nice to you. No, she hadn't. Which made it all the more of a mystery why I hoped she'd stay. To her, I was a pocket full of coins. A ticket to a better life and nothing more. But to me, she was turning into more than a guide back to my sister. Whether I liked it or not, she was becoming my friend. Aurelia took to pacing again. We need to escape this temple. The soldiers can outlast us. If one gets tired, they can just change our guards. Maybe you should have suggested a better hiding place. Maybe you should have chosen different enemies. I opened my mouth, but no argument came out. She was absolutely right about that. She leaned beside me against the temple wall. If you want to bring down Radoff... Then you must understand the fight it'll be to get to him. Romans love him. They believe in him. Far more than they do in the Emperor. He's a villain, Aurelia. Maybe they don't see what kind of person he really is, but I do. When his voice is in my head, it's so cold it turns my blood to ice. Back at the mines, he told me if I didn't bring him the bulla, he'd leave me to die in the cave. Maybe he was saying it for your own good. Aurelia's eyes settled on the bulla, still in my hand. Maybe he knew that if you tried to keep it, all of this would happen. I brushed past her, 
frustrated with the fact that she was actually making sense. She called after me. You're not alone, Nick. I'm here to help you. You're here to get a reward. I am alone. You're not. She walked up and put her hand on my shoulder. But you have to look at this from the Emperor's view. So far, only one person has done anything to threaten Rome. That's you. As presiding magistrate, Horatio could defend you before the Emperor. Or deliver me to him. Felix said anyone lawyer loyal to the Empire would kill me. Felix should know. He actually tried to do it. And maybe Horatio would succeed. My fists tightened. You can't possibly expect me to trust him. I don't expect you to trust anyone. Even you? Aurelia wavered just for a moment. All I'm saying is that you can't hide forever. That's my problem, not yours. I turned to her. Once I find my sister, we will vanish. No. Once you find your sister, you promise to go to Horatio. I will defend you to him. And why would he listen to you? I asked. A mischievous smile tugged at the corner of Aurelia's lips. Surely by now you know that I make people listen when I speak. I smiled back. I know that when you speak it almost always ends in trouble. You are the last boy on this earth who should speak about trouble. I laughed and moved to brush her aside, but this time she grabbed my arm, playfully twisted it behind me, and then forced me to the ground. I pulled her down with me and she fell at my side, laughing as well. I stared at her a moment, realizing again how pretty her eyes were when she lowered her guard. No, in this failing light of day, they were beautiful. Hearing the sound of footsteps in the doorway, we both sat up. Aurelia went for her knife and I hurried to hide the bullet beneath my tunic again. But there was no need for al alarm, or at least, I hope not. In fact, it was the exact person I had hoped to see again. Crispus. As the son of a senator, he moved in the same circles as other leaders of Rome. With Radolf, specifically. I whispered who he was to Aurelia, and told her to put away her knife, which she did with obvious reluctance. Crispus didn't seem to have come to worship. Rather than an offering, in his arms were two folded togas. He smiled and said, My father spotted you two running in here earlier today. We hoped you'd still be here. With those soldiers outside, where else would we have gone? Aurelia asked. Father's out there now, distracting them with some absurd orders, but it won't last long. Crispus grinned. If you want to escape from this temple, you must come with me right now. Aurelia started to protest, but I muttered that she could sort out whether Crispus should be trusted after our escape. He might be dangerous to you, she hissed. I only smiled, but still not as dangerous as you are. She chuckled and, more important, didn't disagree. Crispus held out the togas to each of us. Have you ever considered dressing up like old women? My smile widened. To escape this building, I was ready to consider nearly anything. Chapter 28 Crispus gave Aurelia her toga. And since I had never worn one, she helped me with mine. It seemed like a lot of unnecessary cloth, most of which had been carried over one arm. But he told me since only the wealthy could afford so much cloth, the soldiers would see it from a distance and assume we were patricians. Keep your heads covered, like older women do, he said. I'm barefoot, I said, holding up one foot. If they see... Let's hope they don't. And if anyone approaches, let me do the talking. That was fine with me. Whenever I talked, it only seemed to end in trouble. Crispus led us through a side door of the temple that exited onto an open-air portio. 
as warm as it was that evening. At least we felt the breeze now. The afternoon heat inside the temple had been stifling. It's getting late, but there should still be some markets open in the basilica ahead, he said. We'll blend in with the people there. Just don't look back at the soldiers. He glanced at me. And don't look down. Only slaves do that. I hadn't realized I was. Raising my head felt unnatural, but he was right. Keeping my head down was the attitude of a slave. I had spent too many years with my eyes cast downward, and my head and knees ready to bend upon anyone's orders. Well, anyone other than Sal. I had never willingly obeyed him. Why are you helping us? Aurelia asked. Crispus looked at me as if it had been my question. Because you need our help. And because Rome needs you. We made it inside the basilica without drawing anyone's attention. Over the top of the crowd, I saw all three stories of the interior were open, and every wall from floor to ceiling was lined with arches. Crispus told Aurelia she could remove the toga from her head, but suggested I stay covered. At least 50,000 Romans saw you in the amphitheater five days ago, he said. It's safe to assume that many of them are here now and will recognize you. Each shop we passed in the basilica was different. had different wares. I assumed the signs over each one identified their products and vowed again to one day teach myself to read. But for now, I couldn't take my eyes off the items being sold. There was so much more than I could believe existed in the entire world, much less in this great city. One of the final shops was putting out warm baked bread. Without even thinking of what I was doing, I stopped in front of the loaves, just to take in the glorious scent and hope it filled my stomach enough to dull the ache of hunger. Crispus walked back and stopped beside me. When he spoke, his voice was kind. When did you last eat? It had been the half bowl of sour porridge from yesterday morning, and I'd had nothing in four days before that, but I couldn't bring myself to say the words. I only lowered my eyes and hoped he'd just walk on so we could go. Head up, Crispus reminded me. He reached into a bag he carried and withdrew some coins for the shop owner. A large loaf, he said, pointing. That one. I took a step back, unsure of what to do. I was almost delirious with hunger and whatever strength I might have had was constantly drained by trying to control the magic of the bulla. Yet I couldn't accept this from him. Crispus took the loaf and broke it in half, then gave one portion to Aurelia, who immediately dug into it. He held out the other half to me. Take it, he said. You're so thin a feather could knock you over. My eyes moistened and I shook my head. No, I can't. Just like the apple, he said, smiling. You can pay me for it later. I have nothing. Take it. Crispus pressed the loaf into my hands. Please, Nick. I immediately ripped pieces from it, as large as I could fit in my mouth without choking. The bread we got at the mines was little more than a baked paste of coarsely ground flour and dirty water. This was soft and fragrant and slightly sweet. It filled my stomach and warmed my body, and for the first time since I had eaten all those strawberries, I didn't feel completely hollow inside. Once I was finished, we left the basilica. Don't look around at the sights, Crispus corrected me. The wealthy have been here a thousand times. There's nothing they haven't already seen. I turned away, but it wasn't easy. As impressive as my first glimpses of Rome had been, nothing equaled the beauty of the Forum. It seemed to have been made for the gods themselves, and yet even the lowest Roman was freely given this place for work, play, or worship. The sun was setting, and from our direction, Caesar's temple left us in shadow. That seemed an apt description for my life at the moment, wearing Caesar's bulla, a bulla I had stolen. 
I was now seeking a way to survive beneath his shadow. Aurelia fell in step beside me. Where is he taking us? To my home, Crispus said. My father will meet us there. And my sister is there too? I had so much to tell her. Crispus stopped and his brows pressed together when he looked at me. Nick, I'm sorry. My father did send someone to the mines to get her, but she had already been taken away. We don't know who took her or where she is. My heart thudded like a cold stone against my chest. I could barely comprehend his words. From the moment Sal had told me Livia was taken from the mines, it seemed obvious that Valerius would have had her safe and well cared for. But if it wasn't him, then who? Radolf. It was his way of getting to me. Maybe I had whispered his name, because at my side Aurelia shook her head and leaned into me. That doesn't make sense. You told me that Radolf thought you died in the cave. Livia was taken from the mines before he saw you alive in the arena. So Radolf wouldn't have had any reason to take her. I threw out a hand in frustration. Who else would it be? Heads turned our way and I lowered my voice. All I can tell you is she's innocent in this. And he certainly knows I'm alive now. So if it wasn't his plan before, it will be now. Crispus stepped toward me, with his tall shoulders hunched. We'll find her. I can't imagine Radolf would have had any use for her. But she must be somewhere. I agree, Aurelia said, if she's still alive. Don't say that like it's a question. Ignoring reality doesn't change it. Listen, she probably is alive. I'm only saying that Radolf is a military man. He doesn't need girl slaves. He might have sold her off ten minutes after taking her from the mines. She could be anywhere by now. That didn't make me feel better. And if I was angry with Aurelia for saying it, it was only because she was right. Crispus cleared his throat. I know this is a bad time to be getting such news, but we need to keep moving. People are watching us. Aurelia looked around. Who? Crispus nudged his head to where we had just been in the shops. My heart sank. Only one man was watching me, but his mouth was curled in disgust. It was Sal, lurking in the corners like a shade escaped from the underworld. Despite Crispus and Aurelia surrounding me and the toga over my head, he clearly knew exactly who I was. All he needed to do was say my name and we'd be surrounded. But for reasons I couldn't explain, he didn't. I lowered my eyes, lifted the toga higher on my head, and followed behind Crispus, hoping that was the last I'd see of Sal for the evening. Or better yet, for the rest of my life. Aurelia remained at my side. She grabbed my arm to weigh down my pace, and once Crispus was a little farther ahead of us, she said, are you sure we should go with him? If he doesn't have Livia. I'm not going to Horatio. Not yet. That's our bargain. What bargain? Crispus is taking me to Valerius, not you. My irritation wasn't entirely her fault. I was terrified for my sister. Nervous about what Valerius might want from me. And delicious as it was, the bread had only barely filled the deep well of my hunger. But on top of all of that, I didn't need to hear her constant pleadings for me to turn myself in to a pompous senator, who would most likely pass me straight on to the executioner. If you're so eager, go run and tell Horatio where he can find me. Maybe he'll still give you that precious reward money. Do you think the money is all I care about? That's exactly what I think. Why can't you see there's more going on than who will have the pleasure of hauling me in chains before the Emperor? Her mouth opened in protest, then closed, and she said, Since we've met, I've been shot at, threatened, chased, and nearly drowned. If all I cared about was the money, 
I'd have disappeared long ago. Then what do you care about? I asked. It's not finding my sister. You don't even know her. But I know you. And... And I don't hate you, Nick. No matter what you believe. Maybe we disagree about Horatio, but that doesn't mean I'm trying to hurt you. I glanced sideways at her. I don't hate you either. But until I find my sister, we'll continue to disagree. Her mouth opened again, but this time she said nothing, and only mumbled that we should catch up to Crispus before he got away from us. I adjusted the toga over my head again before joining them. When I did, I noticed her hand at her neck, as attached to that crepundia as I always was to the bulla. With enough reward money, she could make herself into a respectable young woman of Rome, and that might give her access to her family again. And therein was the problem. It was becoming increasingly obvious how flawed our bargain was. The only way she succeeded with her goals was to get the reward money from Horatio. But even if I defeated Radolf, there was no guarantee Horatio would persuade the Emperor to let me go free. In fact, Horatio might not even deliver me to the Emperor. For all I knew... He wanted the bulla for himself, and would kill me to keep it. Aurelia and I were careening toward an impasse. For her to succeed in what she wanted most, I would most certainly have to fail. <laughs>